And <clears throat> after doing a lot of schools, I remember Jake Barnes saying one time about not being a hero, meaning use a big enough loop that you have insurance each time to where, you know, the, really the key to it is um, when you're real snappy with your loop or whatever, it's not that you have to just barely catch them horns to be snappy. It's like the minute, the minute you see the horns go in it, being really good at snapping your loop shut, and then you'll, you, you do see a lot of kids nowadays trying to barely catch the horns, like maybe something like this. And, and really, in reality, like roping for a living, like T said the other night, we want to catch by this much every time. And that gives us a little bit of insurance that if that steer cuts to the right or our horse does something on us, that we're gonna, we've got some room for air. I do the same thing healing. I try to make sure I have extra loop coming in every time. And then if, and if my horse shuts me or the steer gets out away from me, I'm still catching two feet. So I'm on with clay. Using a little bit bigger loop, I think, is a, a good idea. I got to brag on T a little bit. This, this is real honest to goodness, remembering back 30 some years stuff right here. But uh, I invited Jake Barnes to come into the PRCA, you know, and we roped the first three years together. And Jake come and live with Peggy and I. And, and the first guy to ever pull the slack out between their hands was T. I mean, he kind of helped revolutionize that. And what I mean by that is m most people, when they, when they, uh, minute I mention your name, is that a T-woman loop or what? But most people, when they throw a loop, <clears throat> they'll grab this tight with their right hand and pull this coil out. And then you always end up with a lot of slack. And it's funny, you know, him standing over there, he was the first guy that I ever seen squeeze with his left hand, slide with his right, and pull the slack out between his hands. And uh, me and Jake would talk about that. And Jake really, really worked on being able to rope and get the slack out between his hands so that it would come tight real quick. And the, 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 more, the sooner it's tight and on the saddle horn, the quicker you can get the steer's head. So you guys, that is something if you're not doing it, you might think about squeezing with your left and sliding with your right like this. And it always helps it come tight there instead of pulling that slack out. But it's funny, like I said, seeing him standing over there, just all those years ago, this would have been like in 1980, 32 years ago, Jake and I are talking about, well, have you been watching T and the way T does that? Roping really has come a long way with that. That's all the bragging I'll ever do probably on you, T. Was this the 60s? <laughs> Give or take 20 years. The worst habit I've got is getting a good swing over one's back and then want to throw the floater. What do you got to do to work on getting out of that habit? Yeah, you know, um, everybody, you know, questions me about the, my sled instead of you know, uh, uh, the, the legs moving versus the sled. So much, it, he's talking about healing, and his question was about really working on coming in there and getting the swing over the back and then wanting to let off and float it. Well, more and more, Rob, I'm helping people with uh, staying in stride with their horse. Like going, every guy that rides in the arena, they'll generally pick their rope up and you watch them warm up, they'll, they'll be perfectly in time with their horse's stride. I mean, it feels good to swing and stride with your horse and timing is no more than just one swing per jump, like, you know, just like jumping rope like that. Every time the steer comes up, you're taking a swing. But it's the same thing with your horse's stride. So the answer to your question, if you, 
was roping the sled much, oh, whether it's slow, medium, it's, uh, fast. Derek if you'll stay with your horse, your booth. horse will help Derek you at the resist all booth to not go into so that. Be here for about like if you'll just so stay with over. that horse. But when you're roping uh, kind of like a, a hopping steer, a lot of times you'll get a little bit out of whack with it and your tip won't be synchronized. So you'll try to let off. Yeah, well, you'll let off to try to find your timing in your delivery. Or a lot of times you, you'll stab at it. Where that, this really does, it, it encourages a good, solid, confident delivery with staying with your horse's stride and delivering all the way into the bottom of his stop. And then, of course, when you rope live steers, you still have to have that, you know, that same feel of staying with your horse, get in sync with the steer. But, but we, you, it's almost like you get used to that horse helping you. Never, Rich talks about that quite a bit. He talks kind of more about that than he does time in a steer. Is staying with his horse and then roping off the separation there. And you, you, Rich Skelton has always been so good at being disciplined to never float it. And you can always see that he's right with his horse every time. You can kind of see it as I'm telling you that. I mean, he's so good with that. Uh, I come from a state of floaters up in Washington. <laughs> we all floated up there. He was a king of floaters. Yeah. You, you guys hear what he's talking about, the floating thing? And it all has to do with timing. If, you, if you're swinging and not really thinking much about the timing, and then right in here is where you're trying to, all at once, you're trying to make sure that when them legs open up that you get your loop there at the right time and you end up floating your rope or stabbing it. Take all the power off of it and a lot of times you're not riding your horse because your hands and feet work together. So if you slow your hand down, then your legs aren't working and then all at once your horse stops on you. So staying with your horse helps you even with your legs, push him into the stop and control not letting that steer get away from you so far? That's a great question, though, because I'm sure almost everybody deals with that. Any other questions? You got? When you feel like you're getting out of position or you're right by the corner a little bit, where's your vision as far as, like, are you on this side of your horse's neck? And when do you cross over your vision to see the feet on the other side of your horse? Are you more of a feet guy? Do you drive them with your feet, keep driving when you know you're out of position? Or are you looking, seeing the feet? timing and then when it comes you're on your horse other side of your horse's neck. Well now I don't know if this is going to answer your question exactly the way you want but for me is I, if I ever lose vision of the feet I'm in the wrong spot. Like I try to you know like my position basically is three big steps to the right which is 10 foot and, and a, one step back and that's pretty much where you are in the box when you start off. So I'm watching the feet which is right at about 10 o'clock. If that's 12 that's 11. That's 10 o'clock. I try to hold out and use my discipline to wait until that hip moves. Folks, we're about and then when that steer moves out away from me, team roper, I can Patrick see Spears his feet all the way around the corner there, and away. I never lose vision. But if I happen to let my horse like leak in or get a little bit too high, well, then it's like I can't see him as I'm turning in. And it does. It gets you to kind of giving up your body posture, looking around your horse's head. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You just so, ride better position and yeah. So so even, you know, it's like okay, well that's fine like jackpotting, but really even rodeo roping, if you'll work on your fast shots, like getting up here and swinging and getting right, right when the, the smarty turns, trying to rope it right there, you should never lose vision of it. I mean when you miss a haze or something like that and you gotta ride high, just are you pulling off completely? Well, I mean that's that's a to me, a mistake a lot of people make is like the haze is all done that first or second jump out of the box. And I just keep telling people, if you don't do it then, it, it ain't done. Once that steer gets it in his mind to go to the right, but very seldom do you ever climb up there and get high and change his mind on going to the right fence. About all it does is get you in a real vulnerable spot with your roping. Once, he's, once, once I've made that mistake and he's going that way, I'll just keep my spacing and go ahead and let my partner rope him and still go ahead and make a good run, but going off to the right. But the key to that, to me, is like everybody can haze one when he's going slow, 
because we're, we're supposed to be leaving right with the steer or, or medium. But most of us get lazy and our heel horses don't break as hard as what the head horses do. So generally we miss the haze on the, the strong steers. That, that black heifer that runs real hard and the minute the, the gates open, boom, she's gone. So you got to get good at, at being real aggressive and making your horse really leave hard and, and, and reading that. Like the headers are really good at their reaction time of being able to, to leave and get their horse moving fast the minute that steer does. But healers, like on our, well, on any level, we should be doing the same thing. You can haze slow steers, but can you haze fast cattle? There's a reason healers don't have a barrier. Huh? There's a reason healers don't have a barrier in front of them. Well, yeah, and that's, do what? Oh, I thought that's where you come in. Well, he's right about that, but lap and tap, I can't do that. How similar are your three head horses to each other? Say one goes down and you got to mount another one tonight or tomorrow night. How similar are to each horse or each other? I understand more, one's got more heart than the other, but their stride length or height. Do you hear his question? He's wanting to know, like with Clay's horses, how similar are all his horses to the same, right? Well, when they're all good, I mean, any guy that's headed, when they're all good, they're all pretty easy to ride. But, you know, they are different. I've got uh, the two that I got here, one I just bought before I came here, and I rode her in the first two rounds. Uh, the first night, I, right when I was delivering, I hit my hat, and I feel like an idiot, and I'm not an excuse guy. So that actually made me matter than just if I'd have missed the steer. I'd, so I felt like stupid, but... And then I rode around two, and she feels really good to rope on, but I haven't owned her very long. And outside, that fence is really tall here. And I pulled, I rode her outside even with a fence, and she was a little bit more snappy. Well, we missed our first two steers. So I got on the, that little bay that I don't – he's a little bit weird in the box here. He doesn't like to – and so I didn't really want to ride him kind of because of that. He runs almost too hard and then leaves all at once. I feel like I've done a pretty good job on him. But why I rode her is she was just a little bit easier to ride across there, and you, I felt like it was just a little easier to rope on under, under this setup. I like the, you know, the little bay. I'm not really answering your question. A little, I mean, what, they're a little bit, some are a little bit freer, some are a little bit shorter, but you kind of know that going in and you're kind of prepared for their feel because you ride them all. Um, but the one common thing they have is they all score good, leave when you want to, um, not, not trying to drop and get your rope, you know, pretty forgiving kind of horses. And I got, a, I got another mare I didn't even bring here because she runs, she almost scores good enough that I rode her a couple years ago and I couldn't, She's almost trained so good she won't leave when the gates open. And that's what you almost got to do here now. If you got a steer that runs, when that steer starts to move at all, you need to get gone or else he'll, get, he'll beat you a little bit. And she, I couldn't even ride her here because I could not make her go soon enough. And then she almost just run too hard for when you're trying to just throw right there. Because like I said, in any other rodeo, the times are fast, but you got to see him out there a little bit farther. She feels great everywhere else. So, and she's a little bit freer than the other ones. So sometimes I just make sure I throw a little snappier loop or try that a little bit more but that sounds uh, funny doesn't it to say that well this horse scores too good to ride at the nfr <laughs> i've heard a lot of guys say that though yeah we it, what my least favorite thing about coming here is basically giving a bunch of money for a horse and detraining every the reason you bought them because you bought them to stand there and see tail the pin or hip to the pin or tail around the end of the gate that's why because they scored really good and run and then now you get here and you train them, hey, when I go like this, take off. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hard process. I don't know if T or you guys have ever made it. You got to go home and fix it. It's a little bit of a problem for a little bit of a while. I mean, you got to go home and score some and have your healer tricky you over there. Or, you know, I try to take them to jackpots a little bit when I'm done early in the year to get them where I make them have to score all day because you got to. And if your horse don't want to go here, that's the worst case scenario for you. Because you can't get your swings off and get any. If you got to kickstart them, that's when you're in trouble. They got to want to go on their own, and then it's pretty easy to rope. Well, yeah, and hopefully you, you appreciate that when you're hearing him talk about that, and you watch the TV screen, or you're up there and you're watching how long it takes sometimes for them to concentrate and get that horse just right. And what they're doing is they're trying to make sure that when they they get process everything, the way the steer's standing in the box, the way their horse is sitting, the way he feels that he's going to leave off their hand just like that. And that's whatever. Like Cody Ole said the same thing to me the other day. He's like, yeah, man, 
at first, and I, I told him, I said, I've never seen you miss the barrier. It's kind of amazing how great he is at being in the barrier open calves. And he goes, I could not get my horse going fast enough. And he goes, by missing it that much, that put three more strides on my run down there. Yeah, that, yeah, that guy, what he does. Greatest event I've ever seen at one event in my life. I mean, he's the most dominant man I've ever seen. You he's 39 years. No, often, he's yeah. amazing. Guy, I got my, me and my kids go to the fence to watch that guy go. Yeah. So. Any, any other questions? Maybe one more. I'm sorry, yeah, you had another question. Um, earlier he was talking about his horse being very athletic and fast, and you do a lot of slow work with that horse. How much actual fast runs do you practice on good horses? Did you guys all hear what she said there? W wanted to know, it. real hot-blooded horse, run real hard. How much slow work and how much fast work? How many really fast runs would he make on his horse? Yeah, like on the like the little bay that I'm riding here, um, like the same one I won the George Strait and the BFI on. I mean, if I, I I exercise him every day, me or my wife, we get out there. I mean, we're relentless on that deal. We'll we'll keep him in good shape. But I probably run when I rope on him four or five, and, and I might make him. I don't make him see him way out there. And everybody wants to well, show me how fast he is. Well, I like we'll buy a tape. You can see how fast he is. Like sometimes I like to rope slower steers on him, not make him try so hard or as much as I can. And I'll, I'll score some on him. You, you hardly don't need to score him, but I'll just score some on him just to make him relax and chill out in the box a little bit. Um, I got a sorrel mare that's real good that I ride quite a bit at the rodeos, and uh, you don't got to score as much on her. I don't run a lot on her. She, uh, same deal, just keep her in shape. She's really free practicing. Like, it's, it's amazing that how she works when you get her somewhere because she'll almost want to run by the steer practicing. She wants to run so hard. And uh, I just kind of let her be that way. And this new one I've got, I've been riding her. Uh, I got a lot of mares for some reason, but uh, just been riding her, you know, six, eight steers, trying to get used to her. I'll kind of rope and hold them up, though, a little bit, um, not just make them leave out of there real hard and make them pull the steer, face them sometimes, not face them sometimes, just kind of keep them. Because some horses get used sure. to when they hear the heel rope thrown, they want to quit pulling, so I'll undally and keep going. Sure. Or sure. Uh, tell my healer to, uh, you know, don't dally on this one, and I'm going to pull him more, uh, stuff like that. But w what I think a big deal as a header is, is I, I'm a, I like to practice a lot, so I'll get a practice horse. And not that they're not any good, because they are, but that's when I get my healer as realistic goes. And I'll just go it. I'll reach every time or see him way out there. Whatever I need to work on, that's what they're for. And, I, and they're actually good horses, so I get good practice. But, I, you know, I kind of practice everything on them. And I know if you don't have the... The amount of horses I have, you know, I, I would recommend, you know, if, they, if they're in good shape and, you know, eight to ten steers a day, I guess, on a head horse. It's kind of it's whatever your horse, would, you know, can take. I think he's going to.